Welcome back to another episode of the New Levels Coaching Podcast. We are the endurance coaching podcast that brings the endurance world lots of inspiration and education so you can literally go away and run with it. This week, we have a very special guest. Tom Evans joins the podcast. For those of you who are familiar with Tom, you will know that he is in the trail and ultra space. For those of you who don't know Tom, then stay tuned. You're going to get to know a lot about Tom and his plans for 2024. Thankfully, Tom is based here in Loughborough, so it was easy for me to come and grab him and bring him in to, to the studio this week. But I seen Tom put something on social media and I wanted to deep dive into that with him. It was around his 2024 race plans, which includes big races such as UTMB. But backtracking to right now, he actually goes to the World Cross this weekend, which is super, super exciting. Tom is a former, well, still is the current Western States champion, I believe, until they race again in 2024. (laughs) He has podiumed at the big UTMB race itself. He, uh, If I sat here and listed all his accolades, I'd be sat here for a very long time. He is part of the Adidas T-Rex Trail and Ultra Running Team. He's sponsored by many a sponsor, but including Red Bull. You'll see that from his cap if you're looking at YouTube. I'm absolutely delighted to have him joining us on the podcast to chat about his 2024 season. So, Tom, welcome to the pod. Thanks very much for having me. No, uh, yeah, super excited to, to be here today. And yeah, like we say, we we're both in Loughborough and we see each other quite a lot and whether it's with training or just bumping into each other. So no, thanks for having me on the pod. Well, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed watching you train this year. You know, you trained with our group a couple of times, particularly as you're gearing up for some of the faster work as opposed to the longer work. And I guess that's what um, struck me when you put out your race plan this year. I, I kind of knew what your race plans were and then you publicized that on social media. And I thought, God, I really want to dive deep into that because I feel like people can learn a lot from planning their year out. And we'll go on to that and we'll, we'll touch on that but um i am aware that some or majority of our listeners will know who you are i'd say 90 to 95 percent of them will uh, but some might be sat there thinking actually i don't know tom so i thought a really good starting point will be to give them a bit of an insight into who you are but also how you got into running because that for me is a fascinating story thanks very much so yeah i'm tom evans 32 year old professional ultra distance trail runner and just normal runner i guess now um, I, yeah, I left school, uh, at 18, uh, went to Sandhurst and joined the army. Uh, and while I was serving in the army, I had some friends who did a race called Marathon de Sarp that is a 250 kilometer multi-stage self-supported race across part of the Sahara desert. And they did it in 2016 uh, and they did really well. They finished top 300. That was, yeah, incredible seeing as there's just over 1500 people who do it so yeah nice. right finished right at the top um they got back from the race um and yeah to celebrate we went to the pub had a couple of beers and i was fit and i did all sorts of sports and played yeah high level team sports and did a bit of running but only to stay fit um and foolishly i bet them that i could finish higher up than they did um I had run a 10K before, but that was it. I'd never done anything, anything longer than that. Um, I didn't have a coach. I self-coached. If I had an hour, I'd run for an hour. If I had two hours, I'd run for two hours. Um, And serving in the Welsh Guards and the infantry at the time. Um, Yeah, fast forward to April 2017. Um, There I was in the middle of the Sahara Desert. (laughs) Um, Incredibly naive, but incredibly stubborn at the same time. And... Yeah, that was my that was my journey into into running. Um, you got the bug from there, and yeah, I really caught the bug. It was I just loved the challenge, um, and I think that's sort of why I've I guess been a little bit more drawn to ultras because the form book kind of goes out the window, and what you're what you're capable of doing on paper is almost irrelevant when the weather gets really bad, or it's really hot, it's really cold, the terrain is difficult. It doesn't really matter what your VO2 max is um, or your history in the sport. It's not a standard, okay, in order to run 10,000 meters, you need to have a fast 5,000 meters. In order to run a fast five, you need a fast three. In order to run a fast three, you need a fast 15 and so on and so forth. So yeah, I fell in love with the sport in 2017 and um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to, after Marathon de Saab, to be invited to a couple more races in 2017 
Um, How did that go just out of interest, Tom? Where did you finish? Uh, I finished third. Wow. Um, wow. First ever one. On the first ever one, yeah. First non-sub-Saharan African male to finish on the podium. What What were you thinking there? Like, as a novice, you're thinking, oh, this, this is pretty easy. <laughs> I went out pretty hard on the first day, but I didn't feel like it was hard. And I was leading the race until a kilometre to go. And Wow. Four Moroccans then came past and sort of just looked at me and they must have thought, what is this guy doing? Like, why is he, <laughs> he is, he might be here today, but he's not going to be here tomorrow or definitely not the day after. And the same things just kept happening every day. And I was recovering between as much as you can. Um, and I just felt, I just felt really good and got to the long stage that was the fourth day to so draw on pretty much three marathons on day one, two, and three. And then day four is a double marathon. Cheapest. And yeah, it was 80, I think it was 82K. Um, and it just felt great. It was my best day by far. Felt really strong. Ended up finishing second on that stage and just loved it. Amazing. Um, Amazing. And yeah, from there, it sort of, yeah, have sort of dabbled around different distances and still do. Um, and I think that's the interesting thing with trail running and ultra running. There is no, yes, there is a definition, but it's anything from 50K upwards. Yeah, and you said the, the invite started coming to races, but something you touched on there, which I want to touch back on, Tom, I always say to people, um, and I, I was actually saying it on a run this morning with, with Sam Stabler here in Loughborough about how cross-country for me is a bit of a leveler. You know, it brings people together and it, it's a real test. But I was explaining to him about how trail and ultra really does level the playing field. And I explained it to him and said, well, like a 5K, Sam, it's pretty much a physiology test. You know, the yep. person with the best VO2 max or a person who can sustain the best velocity of VO2 max is very likely to come out on top. Yep. Or certainly if you tested the, the majority of people, we would have a correlation there. I said, put physiology in ultra running. We see no correlation. We see bits. Um, they've, they've actually tested at UTMB. They've seen bits with VO2 max plays a part. But there's so many variables. And your stubbornness is just one of those, but it obviously worked. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think with the, if you take sort of the three standard parts of running in a mountain ultra, the uphill, the flat, and the downhill, it would be very, very unlikely that there is one person who's the best at all three of those. Yeah. Typically, a very good uphill runner is okay on the flat and okay on the downhill a good flat runner is okay on the uphill very good on the flat okay on the downhill and a good downhill runner is okay on the up okay on the flat and good on the down so there is there'll be parts that you might be further behind your competition then level then in front and it just changes the whole time and it's it's not necessarily a question of who wants it the most but I think it is, it's far more than just a physiology assessment. And then you put in bad weather, you put in running through the night. It's, yeah, not the best athlete on paper, but the athlete who is prepared the best is the one who will win. Yeah, and, and that's what I really like about it. I think it's what's drawn me into it, to be honest. I think it's, it's so fascinating. It's like a game of chess, and, and it's not just yourself as well. You rely, uh, you rely on support crews as well, and like you say, it's the preparation before, and then it's the execution during. Um, it's even how you're recovering afterwards as well, especially if you've got a long season, yeah, as, as, as you have, because last year, I, I guess I'll, I'll touch on that before we go into 2024, obviously you're career then spiraled possibly out of control a little bit as well and last year it led to winning um the, the famous western state which was a huge huge result and you were one of the athletes who tried to do that western states utmb double which for males is yet to be achieved and it's an incredible feat if somebody does do it but it shows the importance and i guess it shows um how much of an effect it does have doing one ultra into that especially of that uh, you know that level so if we backtrack to last year western states was was it fair to say that was your main goal for the year off the back of utmb the previous year yeah 100 percent um and i think for these big races like the utmb like western states you have to put all of your eggs in one basket for it if you mm. want to win um unless you are incredibly talented but i don't think and I think the saying of, sort of hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard is just, it couldn't be truer in ultra running. And I think that's sort of a huge difference 
um, in ultra running compared to, yes, I'm not saying road runners and track runners don't work hard, but if you've not got the, if you've not got the physiology for the track, the, you're, it, there's not an awful lot. Yes, you can improve yeah. and you can achieve your PB, but if you've not got the right physiology, you're probably not going to go to the Olympics. Yeah, you, you're limited. Out. It's like saying to, let's go back years ago, let's say we're going to put Linford Christie and say, right, Linford, you're going to compete over 1,500 metres. It's yeah, just exactly. not going to work. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. And I think for, yeah, and I think for the long you go, the less of a factor that is. So yeah, Western States was my was my big goal. And I guess we sort of broke it. And me and my coach, Scott Johnson, we broke it down into sort of, right, what are the... What are the important parts of this race? Um, firstly, it's a net downhill race. Mm -hmm. So muscular conditioning was, and especially muscular conditioning under fatigue was really important because the race isn't won in the first half of the race, but it can be lost if you go too hard. So that was the first factor. The second one was the specificity of the environment starting at altitude in the cold and the further into the race you get the hotter the temperature gets so being able to control core body temperature as much as possible so that was really interesting coming up with different uh cooling strategies and then actually on race day it wasn't that hot relatively it was still 30 degrees but it could have been 40. Mm -hmm. um and then the third one and probably the least specific it's just the distance. Yeah. 100 miles is 100 miles. Um, and being able to yeah, maintain a an effort for what, 14 and a half hours was the plan. And that's, I ran uh, six minutes over. Um, yeah, so pretty, pretty accurate, isn't it? When you plan it like that. And so, and it becomes, and it doesn't, a lot of people say, oh, sort of by being so scientific, does it take the joy out of it? And it's like, for me, no, not at all. Because... I don't like surprises and I don't like the unknown. And if you, yeah, in an ultra race, there are very few things that you can control. But if you can control those things, it's going to make your day significantly more pleasant and way more achievable. And whether that's you want to win the race or you want to finish the race, it's going to increase the chances of that happening, which I think is... Yeah, is for me the biggest takeaway because it's not just relevant for those at the front of the race. It's relevant for everyone in the race. I think there's a couple of really good points to take away from that. Like, firstly, when you said about, you know, the the, spec the specificity of the race, um, I read a lot about Western States, about how it's more of a runner's race and uh, that's going to suit certain people. And, and knowing you now, like I do, I would have said Western States suits Tom. Um he's a runner that's going to be a great race for him to target and i i believe a lot of people and this is an advantage i think in the trail and ultra world is you can pick races that potentially suit you uh the type of runner that you are whereas back to track or back to road yes you could pick a road race like a marathon like a boston marathon may suit somebody more because it's hilly but a track is just a track <laughs> you're not escaping it so you could pick some races the other thing that you said there when you said you don't like surprises i'm a strong believer that the mind doesn't really like surprises either the more familiar the mind is with things the more comfortable it often is yeah so I, i'm i'm totally with you i think some people just find it really hard to be scientific because they think they've got to think about it a lot but if you can take that away from yourself and do a little bit with your coach, which I imagine you did with Scott, it almost kind of elevates the pressure off your shoulders because you're going, actually, you know, Scott, you, you tell me what to do. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go out and execute it. And if it goes to plan, great. But you know what? At least it's not the unexpected when I get out there. And that's it. And I think you can definitely go too far that way and trying to think, oh, well, what if this happens, I'm going to do this. And if that happens, I'm going to do that. The reality is, and the likelihood is, that that stuff won't actually happen during the race. Something else will happen. So if you can be still on the start line and be confident and have the ability to make those snap decisions when you need to make them, and if you make the wrong decision, it doesn't matter as long as you realize you made the wrong decision and you change, but better to make that decision now rather than being sat on the fence and thinking, oh, should I do this, should I do that? And then 10 minutes goes by and you've still not made the right decision. So I th yeah, I'm a huge believer of, yeah, preparing for these things, going through what 
can happen. But knowing that things will happen outside of my control, you can't do anything about it. When it happens, deal with it. And then, yeah, you're like you said, you're just removing all of that stress. You know that something is going to happen. Sort of the, yeah, the the uncontrollable almost becomes the controllable because you know it's going to happen. You know you're going to have a bad patch. You know something's not going to go to plan. And the ability to be like, right, well, when that happens, like that's exciting. Yeah, because you've you've anticipated it. Precisely. Yeah, yeah. And and linking that to things like nerves as well. A lot of people who we coach say, oh, you know, I get I get nervous and I get, you know, really bothered by that and that affects my race. And I think it's easy for people to forget that even at the top end of the sport, the, you know, the level you're competing at, we get nervous. You get nervous. Everybody gets nervous. Everybody sure. has bad patches. Everybody's the same, but it's how you deal with those. And the more practice and preparation you put into that, the better you will deal with it. Exactly. And I know we'll come on to talk about my race schedule for the year, but if I was racing ultras in a year, I'd race three, maybe four times in a year. So that's three or four times to practice going through this whereas this year I think I've raced five times already which is unheard of for me and I've got to be able to practice that going into everything and I think just touching on nerves you you actually you break it down it's why am I nervous for this is it because I'm afraid that I'm not going to succeed and if that is the case well then you sit down with your coach six months before the race if this happens at every race you sit down and it's like, right, well, what do we need to do in order for me to be still on the start line, confident in that I'm able to achieve what I want to achieve? Yeah. And I think that's why people are most nervous because they're worried about failing. What's, what is failure? It's a race at the end of the day. Who, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter because if things go really, really well, that's brilliant. You've achieved what you set out to achieve. Brilliant. You're then going to get to Monday and you go back to work or you're with your family or you go to the supermarket. No one knows whether you failed or you've succeeded. It's all in your mind. And for me, it's like, did I learn something from this? And did it make me a better athlete, a better person, a better husband, whatever? If that's in the whole process, if that's a yes, then brilliant. And that's why for me, sort of setting goals on one side is absolutely brilliant. But I think so many people set the wrong goals that end up becoming so unachievable. And actually, if you, I do uh, an exercise every year. In the first week of January, I write down what I want to achieve in that year on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope and put it away. Nice. I like and that. then 12 months later, and there'll be some things that seem so mundane in it, on it. But at the time, they're really important. And then you realize that when you achieve one goal, you're never satisfied because you then want to go. And I think the easiest way is talking about sort of marathon PBs. As soon as if someone's goal is to run sub 230 and they run 228.30, brilliant, you've achieved your goal within two weeks. And you've been preparing that for, let's say, a year. Within two weeks, you're thinking, right, how do I run sub 225? And you've forgotten that you ever ran outside of that. And you almost, you've been worrying for six months about this. You've achieved it. And then your goalposts then change straight away. And I think it's, yeah, there's the saying of, like, don't let the wins go to your head or the losses go to your heart. It's just a race. Like I I had a nightmare at UTMB last year. Yes, I really want to do the double. I ended up not celebrating Western States at all because I won that. And then I was like, oh, well, now I want to go and win UTMB in the same year. That was never the plan. Don't get greedy. Yeah. And that was, and it's so easy in hindsight to look back. And at the time, it was my biggest regret from last year was not enjoying the win and setting the next huge lofty goal and then not being prepared. But I think you made a good point earlier and we talk a lot about it with the athletes we work with is um, 
don't see it as a fail, you see it as a learning. So you learn from that last year and you go into this year and you say, okay, well, I am going to celebrate those big wins because you, you said you learn from everything. And I think it's a it's a really good point that everybody can take away because you're right. And, and there's a couple of analogies here where um, you get that goal, as you described, the, you know, the 230 marathon, Pop, the most popular goals in the world of any running related discipline are round numbers, three hour marathon, four hour marathon, 90 minute half, you know, breaking two hours for the first time for a half. Um, but when people get there, they jump to the next round number. And I always say to people, well, there's a lot of numbers in between that, you know, that you, sh- yeah. you should be happy with. And I think Kipchoge said it best when he also, he described it as, you should also be satisfied to sit on the branch for a while as well and back it up before you then make the next step to the next branch. And you keep climbing that tree. But so many people get to the branch and then they want to go up to another branch straight away. There's only one way you can go. If you keep, there are only a finite amount of branches. Absolutely. And you get to the end, that's, and you see, and it's such a shame because you see so many people quitting whatever sport it is at such an early stage because the next branch seems so far away and so unachievable. Whereas actually you look at, you look, take someone, I'm talking about the marathon, take someone like Phil Sessman. Yeah. Who has just slowly and slowly improved in his marathon and he's got to the 211.30 standard, which has now been blown out the water to 2.8.10 to qualify for the Olympics. And he's just slowly plugged away. And then three, four years ago, that would have been, that would have seemed so unachievable, but just slowly plugging away, plugging away, plugging away. And you get there, you can get there eventually. And I think that's the best example of, doing things that three, four years ago, you may not have thought were possible, but they don't happen overnight. And I was with Phil at the weekend up in Leeds and he did a QA. and a And one point that was really fascinating and I, would, I, would, I want to share it with the audience was Phil said he's pretty much improved his marathon PB by about five minutes, just inside of five minutes. Yeah. And as you've just rightly pointed out, he said, when you look looked at that, some people might have thought that was unrealistic in the, the time frame that he's done it. But he also said... If you looked at my training, he said, you wouldn't think I'm five minutes better now than when I was doing the training for my first marathon. He's like, in fact, a lot of it's still the same. But he said, it's that consistency of doing the same thing and learning and and being prepared to run 211, 212 a few times before you get there, before that jump then comes. And I found that really fascinating because I think people always want to see the performance is first in training and think, why am I not improving? But sometimes it's just that consistency that leads to those performances. And we saw, you know, an incredible achievement at the weekend with Jasmine Paris completing the Barclays. And back to your point on failure, Jasmine had not completed the Barclays in previous years, um, but had become the first female to get to the three lap point. And and then this year has obviously gone beyond that to the fourth and fifth. But it would have been easy for people to look at it last year and say, well, she failed. No, she didn't. She's just learned. And then she's come back this year and look, and now everyone's like, oh, amazing. But again, with your UTMB, I want to relate this all back to each other. Um, I think you made a really valid point around people don't care, but the people who do care are the ones who are around you in that inner circle. And they'll care whether you succeed or whether you don't. And I bet you had just as many messages when UTMB didn't go well, hoping I think people said, hope you're okay, Tom, because yeah. they care about you. Yeah, exactly. And I think, and I think that's the, that's the really big, yeah, the really big learning point from all of this is it doesn't necessarily matter how well or badly things may seem at the time. The sun's going to rise tomorrow. You've got, You've got a good group around you and there's always next year or there's always the next race. You then change your plans and you do something, you do something different or you go away and yeah, you refocus on what you can and then you come back the year after or the next race with the fire burning even hotter than it has done before with a plan of, okay, well, this, these were my shortcomings last year. What can I do in the next 12 months to increase the chances of success. And I feel that's a great segue to come onto the race plan. Well, as you say, that is a great segue to go into that race plan. Um, Before we speak about 2024 race plan, did 2023 and what happened in 2023 
affect how you planned into 2024? So was there like a learning phase where you sat down and analyzed that and then said, okay, this is what we've learned from this year and this is now what we're going to do in 2024? Yeah, definitely. Um, Because of just the time of when my A race, Western States, at the end of June, there wasn't that much time to do... I didn't really race that much cross. Um, I raced, I think, one cross race last year that was into counties that was six days after a 100K race. Um, and had a re- and felt great and finished second there. Um, which, yeah, which was... That, by, that was by far, at that point, my best cross-country performance. Um, but yeah, I raced 100K in... Uh, beginning of March. So everything was pretty quick and actually rewind a little bit. And I guess the thing is the year and the train, you don't start from zero on the 1st of January or you, or <laughs> a great point. you do a race and it doesn't, everything feeds into everything else. So if I rewind even further back to, well, I guess it all started. I had a serious knee injury in 2021 I had knee surgery six days before UTMB in 2021, and I was just out of hospital when UTMB was on. That's motivation for you straight away. I then slowly, slowly got back into into training. I raced a, a couple of small races, Charmwood Hills, um, a local race to us in 2022, and then started then raced a 30k a 60k and 80k and then i raced utmb in 2022 uh we then got married in november 2022 then went on a honeymoon at the end of 2022 did no running for pretty much didn't run for three weeks um that'll be a shock to a lot of people yeah you you can train for years and years and years you don't lose everything overnight. Yes, you'll feel sluggish. Yes, you do lose. Yes, you might gain a bit of weight. But you have a ceiling of your performance. And if you're at your ceiling the whole time, it's so difficult to maintain. You need to go up and go down. And I think one thing that's really misleading, and it's my, I, I love Strava. I use Strava a lot. It's my pet hate of Strava is showing how much people are training every week. Mm, like there is... Yeah. People see, oh, I need to be running 100 miles a week. What's the, firstly, what's the difference between running 95 miles and 105 miles a week? There's nothing. But people want a completely flat, oh, I've been super consistent. But that doesn't take into account intensity. That doesn't yeah. take into account elevation gain. That doesn't take into account any cross-training you're doing. My Strava is all over the place. Mm. My hours and the intensity and how we calculate things is pretty similar every week but it might look different. Um, so taking time off, I think is, if you want to stay in the sport for a long time and you want to genuinely achieve and be consistent, consistency for me isn't measured in days or weeks or months, it's measured in years. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think it, it goes, a, goes a huge way. So that then takes us into beginning of 2023, so Western States year, I started training again I ran a park run on Christmas Day in 2022. I remember because I ran a park run the same day and you came up as one of the fastest park runs that week. You did it at home, didn't you? Uh, Yeah, I did it it in Kent, but I ran, it was... 15, 20 something? Oh no, it was slower than that. Was it? Okay. It was more like 16, 20. Oh really? I I think I ran to 325s. Wow. And that was going, I couldn't have gone much harder. Yeah. And so, yes, you are going to lose fitness, but it doesn't matter. If you've set your goals and you've set the right goals at the right time, it's all part of the process. So I did that, and then that was a, okay, well, that's fine. Like, I don't need to really be able to run any quicker than that because I'm racing 100K. My average pace for 100K was 430 a kilometer. So fine, you've got time. So then went and did that 100K in the U.S., and then came back to the cross country and then it was built up to Western States. So I had done, it was fairly early. So I hadn't necessarily done that much sort of a huge reverse periodization and got fast, but it's a hundred mile race. Yeah. The speed doesn't really matter. And I focused on other elements of it, like we said earlier, like with the heat um, and like with the muscular conditioning rather than the speed. And actually in that race, it worked really well because the first 
30 miles of the race were covered with snow. So the bits that can people can get carried away and go too fast, you couldn't because there was so much snow. So that massively played into my advantage. But then switching focus after Western States onto UTMB, it was as if I was flogging a dead horse because I had done so much high volume muscular conditioning work. Going into UTMB, it was then the same training for another six weeks and I was just so tired and I had massively, massively overdone it. And even had I not got ill before the race, I don't think it would have gone much better. I wasn't ready. I wasn't as prepared as well as I could have done. So I learned so much from it. So, and identified there were points where going uphill, the conditioning, going downhill, the muscular conditioning was there, but going uphill, the aerobic conditioning was not there. I think from doing so much high volume with not much intensity, my VO2 max and my efficiency had just completely disappeared. And I think if you look at, if you looked at lactate levels in LT1 and LT2, they were probably the lowest that they had ever been. Aerobically, I was probably the fittest because I'd done so much yeah. high volume training. I could have run it 430s all day. But if I needed to work harder and go slower but steeper, I had nothing. That ceiling was lower because your VO2 max was a little bit... So tri- much lower. Yeah, a little bit lower than it would usually be. Correct, because I'd spent so much time doing it. So then for this winter, we thought, right, well, how can I... We've not done a fast, a 10K effort, an LT2 training since before UTMB in 2022. And it worked really well then. Yes, I was getting back from an injury and I didn't do as much, but I did some and it worked really well. We know it worked really well, so why don't we do it again? But up the ante a little bit and let's set a really lofty goal of qualifying for the cross country world championships it's an olympic year it's probably not going to be as competitive and there'll be some people who are missing but what a cool opportunity to be able to put into practice race week and race nutrition and what am i going to eat the night before a race because these are still problems that professional athletes have got to deal with rather than googling it the morning before or 24 hours before your race thinking, oh what should I eat now I've got to practice this so much so now come the big races it's just so dialed in and you sort of almost go into an automatic robot mode that okay this is what I need to eat this is my timings this is when I need to take this supplement this is when I need my bicarb this is when I have this 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 is my caffeine plan And it's now so easy. So there's the nerves and the stress. There is none. So you can enjoy it a little bit more. And yeah, you know the process. So yeah, when we were looking at planning it, it was a, okay, let's world cross. Yes, it's a bit late this year. It's at the end of March. But actually my main race is UTMB this year, which is at the end of August. I've still got so much time. time. I am not planning on being, I am planning on peaking properly once this year. Yeah. And that's at UTMB at the end of August. So why you can't maintain a peak for between March and August, it doesn't work, especially with ultra endurance running. So it, for us, it was, like, okay, what stepping stones can we use to make sure that I'm as ready as I possibly can be at the end of August? And that doesn't mean that I'm going to be in bad shape from other races. It just means those are, I have one A race, this year, I did it well. Two A goals. The first one over winter was to qualify for world champs yeah. at cross country. That no, I don't think anyone has ever raced world cross country championships and UTMB in the same year ever. Wow, regardless of the year in the history. Interesting. Um, it's a great statistic. If, if you know that statistic, then let us know. Um, but yeah, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. I know there's some good runners in UTMB. Yeah. There was a guy this year, a good marathon runner who went off the front. Yeah. Um, but yeah, World Cross. Not done World Cross. And so I, after World Cross, I would have competed for Great Britain at, at World Championships on the road, half marathon World Champs. Yeah. Um, trail running World Championships in Spain. Yeah. Mountain running world championships in Poland. 
and now cross country world championships in Serbia. Nice. So there's just the track left, which I don't, think I'll, ever, I don't think I'll ever be able to do. <laughs> Let's drop you back down, Tom. <laughs> but I think it's the, it's sort of, I think that example, like you don't have to necessarily pigeonhole yourself into, oh, I only run on the trails or, oh, I only run on the road. Like actually dipping and diving in between each of them. Typically you gravitate to what you're good at and what you like and you stay away from what you're bad at and what you don't like. And actually a lot of the time, the low hanging fruit, and that's a question that Scott and I will ask ourselves, like where can I get easy improvements yeah. and work for six weeks? I'd rather work for six weeks and get 5% increase in performance than work for 12 weeks and get 1%. Um, and yeah, and then I think if you break it down to an even more granular level, if UTMB is going to take me 20 hours this year, 12 of those hours are going to be going uphill. So if I can improve by 1% in 12 hours, that is significantly better than improving 1% for eight hours. Eight hours, it's, yeah. It, and the time-wise, so you think, okay, well, what do I need? Where did I struggle on the uphills? Okay, well, it was when things got intense and I needed a higher my body was producing too much lactate that I couldn't get rid of. Okay, so we need to improve VO2 max or LT1 and LT2. How can we do that? Okay, well, we'll race cross country. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you've, and this is linked back to a couple of podcasts we've done previously. The first thing you've done is highlighted the big, what we call air goals in, in the year, which I think a lot of people don't do. They just enter race, 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 yeah. and go, I'm going to run well at all of those races. And we expect to, like, as if that's ever a thing. So we've we've touched on that before in previous podcasts. If you've not heard it, go back and listen to it. It's, it's a really good episode. But then we've also touched on long-term planning in the past, something Gemma and I have spoken about. And we, we speak about, well, identify the, the weaknesses or areas for improvement that you want to work on, um, some of which will be low-hanging fruit, um, but work on those early and, and get those in the bag. And that's exactly what you've done here. Even though from the outside, people might look at it and go, well, surely Tom's one of the best runners in the field. Like, his running is going to be already so much better than other people over 5K, but this is relative to you. Yeah. And and that's the thing you've identified, isn't it? I can still improve here. I can get that ceiling back up and that's going to help me because people are sat at home thinking, well, how is that going to help with 20 hours? Well, you've just told them. It's like you improve that VO2 max, you shift that lactate curve, you are yeah. going to be so much more efficient and effective on those long climbs. And if you, if you can outrun, it's like a, I guess it's like a seesaw. If I can disrupt everyone else's seesaw and if their curves are, happen earlier than mine, they're going to blow. And if I can keep going at that effort, my effort is my effort. I want my effort to be unachievable for everyone else. Yeah. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not a sprint. It's not even tempo. It's upper end easy is how I would describe it. But I want my upper end easy to be everyone else's tempo. And let, let's break that down a little bit, Tom, because I think when I first got into kind of the trail coaching world and until I experienced it myself, I used to look at that distance and say exactly that to the athletes I work with. Well, you know, you're know, going to be out for 15 to 20 hours. So that's upper end easy. You know, that's that's the system we're looking at physiologically. But then it, it, I quickly realized that within that easy 20 hours, as you quite rightly point out, there's a lot of high intensity and that worries people. They think, God, I can't go high intensity so soon in a race. But you also can't really avoid it. Um, but it is about knowing um, how hard to push. And also, I think the most important factor is knowing how to control that intensity. Uh, quick example, I'm quite good at descending. So I would descend really quickly in these yeah. races. Like 10K later, I was destroyed because yeah. my quads were ruined. I realized I can't descend that quickly unless I'm super conditioned. Yeah. On the flip side, I think we had a conversation outside the podcast room around a lot of people aren't prepared to hike when they're, you know, when the heart rate starts yeah. to rise. That's another way of potentially yeah. controlling things. And I think there, there was a study done at UTMB. Uh, it was either last year or the year, but maybe it was the year before and the data was released last year. But where the top 10 male and female runners made up the most time on the rest of the field and it was all on the uphill interesting the downhill 
was relative. It was, yes, the top runners ran faster downhill, but they didn't, as a percentage, they didn't run, they, they climbed significantly quicker in relation to the mid packers than they did descending. And I think that's the, there is a limiting factor on descending. You don't, if you go too hard, and actually it probably means that the pros are going a little bit slower and preserving their legs because they're able to, that then means they can go much faster on the uphill. And if you're doing a 20 hour UTMB, as you've already identified, 12 hours is uphill. If you slow down by 5% on the uphill, that 12 hours very quickly becomes 13, 14, mm. 15, 16 hours. Yeah. Whereas on eight hours, if you slow down by 5% on the eight hours of running flat and downhill, that's not that much. I will go to almost max heart rate in these races. Interesting. Even and though it's an easy overall. Even though it's easy, easy. Let's say my pace intensity. Max heart rate. Let's say it's 180. Yeah. In and around 180. I will probably do during a UTMB. I'll probably do somewhere between five and eight minutes at over 175. Which is, again, fascinating to listen to from a physiological perspective. But the importance here is if you've done that on the up, because you're then descending and you're not smashing those descents, I can imagine if I was analyzing your heart rate data, that heart rate is coming down despite you then moving quickly down the hill. So quicker than you were climbing, obviously. Yeah. But your heart rate is then recovering. And that's the trick to it, isn't it? It's and that's... As, as close to a golden bullet as you can get an ultra running, that's it. The ability to be able to lower your heart rate quickly and for your body to shift what it needs to shift. And if your lactate curves are further along down the line, that process becomes so much easier. And it may sound like we're talking very sciencey, but it's not at all. It's a the fitter I get. And if you imagine doing intervals, I can do kilometer reps hard i get yeah at 10k effort or half marathon effort and within a minute's recovery my heart rate is it's not quite at resting but it is so low so i have huge it goes up quickly but it then comes down really quickly and yes it's probably a little bit of genetics going into that but it's also you're all it's also what i am training for and you don't necessarily have to train on the mountains to get those training adaptations. So a lot of people say, oh, why do you live in Loughborough? There's no, you're not near the mountains. And it's very, very true. And there are some times where I think, oh, actually it would be amazing if I lived in the Alps mm. because you'd get that specificity. But for me, reducing those other factors, the technical terrain, and yes, you need, still need to train for that. But simplicity, I think is is so important when you're trying to do quite complicated things. Yeah, so that's a really good point because like you say, we were talking science there, but if we break it down very uh, to very basic terms, like if you get to the top of a hill and you are completely out of breath, you're struggling to get back into the, your rhythm, then you've probably gone too hard. You don't need to know what's going on in the body to understand why that is just, that's just a simple way of looking at it. But again, if you look at it from, okay, I want to improve my VO2 max and people say, oh, well, you know, I need to understand VO2 max to do that. Well, you can actually just get in the right sort of zone. So if you if you go and do kilometer reps and you work at sort of nine out of 10 during that session, you're probably going to be in the right sort of zone. Yeah. You know, you can, you can simplify things without, 100%. I think people often want an exact science and we can use science to educate us and, and I love it as, as much as you do. Um, but sometimes we can try and be too close. Yeah. And it, it, Phil, again, back to Phil Sessman at the weekend, he, he said it very, very nicely. He said, um, if I'm looking to work hard in a session, it doesn't matter what the splits are. I just ask myself, did I work hard? Yeah. Quite yeah. simple. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're supposed to be running seventies on a track and you run 71s or 69s, like, you ask yourself, am I working too hard? Am I working too easy? And sometimes, sometimes you'll go fast, sometimes you'll go slower. It's, it's your body doesn't know the splits. Um, and I think it's the same in a, it's the same in ultras. UTMB, it might take, sometimes it's one in 19 and a little bit. Sometimes it's one in 21 and a little bit. 
and that's a huge two hours difference is massive mm. there's a lot of things you can't control you can't control what the weather's doing if it's super hot you're gonna have to slow down and those who don't slow down are gonna blow up if it's super cold things are different if you're if you're and we've not even spoken about nutrition at all that's a huge one the yeah. difference between if it's hot and cold and the nutrition that you need when you're at altitude you're using uh there's less oxygen so you are having to use more glucose more glycogen therefore you need to put more back in when you're running at sea level you don't need as much mm. so the times in these big mountain races when you're at altitude if you say oh i need to consume 80 grams of carbs an hour well, where is that it are you talking about sea level or are you talking about 2000 meters because it's a different thing and and have you even practiced the 80 to start with have yeah. you trained that first exactly um, and because yeah. a lot of people will see these athletes now training it and consuming super high carbs like we for western states i was like 115 grams an hour average so there were some points where i was higher there were some points when i was lower people see that and think oh that's what i need to do i need to go super high carb and we'll ignore the let's get used to taking 60 yeah and let's get used <laughs> to taking 70 and you do it for a couple of weeks and every run you're bringing lou roll with you <laughs> and it's horrendous and then you get to the end oh, i can't do this so you just stop and it's like well no and i guess it'd be the same as okay i want to run a marathon oh, i'm going to go run 208 no 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 you need to start somewhere you can't just dive into the deep end you might be incredibly talented and be able to do it but it is you will have a far more enjoyable journey and you will learn way more by starting it doesn't need to be right at the beginning but starting a step back and it's the same with sessions my first rep for every session will be my slowest Good. I'm glad you said that because I'm exactly the same and I'm trying to get athletes to buy into that the entire time. Um, and it's sometimes that's a little bit to do with how you want to execute a race as well, like to, to practice that. But I just think it's just, it's basic. Like Alex, who used to coach me, used to just describe it best. He's like, you'll just be more warmed up after the first one. Yeah. Again, let's keep it simple. Yeah. You'll yeah, probably yeah. feel better after you've done a rep. So yeah. let's give yourself a little bit of leeway and yeah. let's relate it back um, you know, to, to anybody. Somebody wants to do a kilometer rep in five minutes, eight minute miling. Um, so they go out and they run five or five into the five minutes. Back to your point earlier, it's probably the same zone. Yeah. It's, but you've you've got that one under your belt. And if you want to finish quicker, go and run 4.55 at the yeah. end. Yeah, brilliant. Bring it down. That, for me, that's the perfectly executed, there's a perfectly executed session. Yeah. Um, whereas if you go in and you're supposed to run five minutes, everyone always runs faster than they're supposed to. And I am also guilty of this. But let's say you've got eight by a kilometer and you do the first one too fast. After that, you're, you've blown your session. You're now, your body is in serious aerobic debt. You're using more glycogen and you're probably going to end up running the last one in 520s. And a lot of people won't be prepared to slow down after the first one because they think, right, I've put my marker down now. Yeah. And, and, and they need to run quicker every yeah. single one. And, and now I need to at least maintain that instead of actually making the sensible decision to, well, to back a off a thing. little bit. And, and that's, I, I see that is the biggest problem with people. They think, well, I've done that now. I've committed to it. Yeah. I can't then back off. And psychologically, fin I'm, I'll put it to you, but it used to happen for me, finishing a session running really strongly, feeling good and making it your fastest rep, you bounced home after that session and you took that positive energy into the rest of your week with you. 100%. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And I think like I would much rather end a session early on a high than think like a lot of the times if you say, oh, we've got sort of between eight and 10 reps, depending on how you feel, everyone sort of ignores the eight and thinks, right, I'm doing 10. And it's like, well, no, let's see how I... Let's see how I feel. If actually at eight, things are pinching, just drop out. It's the runner's mentality, isn't it? If they see eight to 10, they're going to do 10. If you give them a pace range of 520 to 540, they're going to go 520. Yeah. We want to go faster side. It's just the mentality we have. But it's that, um, again, we've done a podcast episode on this as well. We sometimes think more is more, but sometimes yeah. less can be more if it's well calculated. I couldn't agree more. I think, yeah, the people always want to, do the maximum amount they can do. Whereas I would flip it on its head and say, what is the minimum amount of training I can do in order to achieve my goals? Yeah. 
because anything else you're putting risk in and you're putting fatigue in. In order to be able to run a three-hour marathon, what do I actually have to be able to do? You don't need to train like you're running a 208 marathon because that's not what you're doing. What is the least amount of work I can do? And it's not being lazy. It's a, okay, I believe in my goals. I've set my goal. Everything else is a... Whereas even if you're at work, if you're doing a spreadsheet... You wouldn't think, oh, I could add this and I could add this and I could add this in. If you don't, if your boss doesn't need it, you're not going to add it in. Yeah. How can you be smart and efficient, not just do more for the sake of it? Exactly. And people talk about sort of, and it then becomes a bit difficult when you're talking about sort of ultra endurance and people. Are, so I see some people sort of wanting to do sort of five, six, seven hour training runs. And you take someone like Camille Heron who's just run the six-day world record at the Lululemon event in the US that was absolutely incredible. She doesn't, she does the occasional four-hour run, but 99% of her runs are less than three hours, mm. never doubles, very rarely doubles. And I think that is just, it's so, for me, it's so inspiring to see someone who's able to run for six days straight. If it's not necessary for her to do too much, and that's consistent. She's built up for over a long, 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 long period of time. She doesn't see the need to do too much more than her body needs. If she's not doing it, you probably don't need to either. And it's Yeah, we can learn a lot from people often say that they can't relate to people at the top of the sport, but there's a lot of secrets there that are shared that we can take from it. And kind of rounding this all off, obviously your your big goal this year, Tom, is UTMB after World Cross. So, yep. you know, best of luck for the weekend. This podcast comes out on the Thursday when Tom travels uh, and the World Cross is this weekend. So tune in to, to see how the whole GB team do. I'm excited by it. It's in, it's in Serbia this year. So um, it's a bit closer to home, which is great. I think the last time it was in Australia. Yep. So a lot, a lot different. Um, but then it is all eyes on UTMB. But where can we expect to see you in the build up to UTMB? Because I'm, I'm assuming that's also been a carefully constructed race plan. Yeah, so I will. So I'll race World Cross this weekend. I'll then take a down week um, and I will have an unstructured training week. Um, nice. And if I want to run, I'll run. And if I want to ride, I'll ride. And if I want to just chill out and play Fortnite, I'll do that as well. <laughs> um, and I think it's it's super important to find. Yeah, don't see the time that you're training is time that you're not training see it as time that you have back it's time where and it's the same as it's the same when you're injured don't see it as oh i should be running now but i'm injured see it as a oh i'm not running now so what can i do i can spend more time speaking to my friends i can do this or i can learn to play the piano i can do duolingo whatever um so i'll then race in seven weeks after um world cross in transvolcania yeah so 70k Fast race, um, downhill conditioning, very important. Uh, but also uphill is very important as well. Um, so it'll be a bit of a transition um, and a video series accompanying that. Two weeks after that, I will, or sorry, three weeks after that, I'll then race the European Mountain Running Championships in yep. Annecy. That's uh, 60 kilometers. Uh, yeah, again, good, good climbing in that as well. Good isn't climbing, um, not over racing, not doing too much, still with a bit of speed, but a very nice transitional period. Um, and then a month after that, I'll then race uh, another longer, slightly longer race, a 50 mile race uh, in on the Austria German border at Zugspitz. Um, before, and then I'll have, uh, I think it's nine, 10 weeks then into UTMB where I won't race. And I would just focus on the real specificities, the UTMB isms. Um, and just get that get that completely nailed. Um, yeah, building up to UTMB with that being the that being the main goal. Um, yeah, like I said, I had two goals this year: one, qualify for World Cross, and then have the prepare. And I guess UTMB is a difficult one, and sort of being super open about my goals for UTMB is once the gun goes off on the start line, you can't necessarily you can't change anything. So my goal for UTMB this year is get to the start line as well prepared as I can. Mm. Um, and that might sound a bit vague and without going into too much detail about it, it's not as vague on paper. Um, but I can't control what other athletes do on yep. the day. I can only do what I can do. 
and looking at past data from myself and then from other athletes like Killian, uh, who's won the race six, seven times now. Um, I know, I think I know what we need to do in order to be in the shape to put your name in the hat for it. Um, but you need to get there first. You need to be on the start line. You need to be injury free. You need to be motivated, excited and ready to go because if you're not, yeah, if you're not, then you might as well, when the gun goes off, you might as well turn around and walk the other way. And there's the big learning from last year, exactly. which you've discussed with me outside and, of this podcast studio before. Yeah, and whether that's, yes, as a professional athlete, you've got certain media commitments to do, but that again is tiring um, without saying the C word. I will wear a mask the whole time because I'm not getting ill again. Um, so yeah, it's a, if you put all of your eggs in one basket and you prepare meticulously for six months leading into a race, you can ruin it in the two days before. And it would be my, one of my biggest bits of advice, whether you're racing a UTMB or an ultra or a marathon is don't get carried away at the expo because you're on your feet for a long time. Like for the, two at least two days going in to a race i will make sure that i'm doing less than ten thousand steps a day including my runs you want to be horizontal for as long as you can and it might seem boring and you're in an amazing place and it's really cool but stay off your feet yeah couldn't agree more with that, particularly for people who are going to major marathons, which I know will be happening over the next few weeks. We are very much into major marathon season now. Here in the UK, we've got big ones coming like Brighton, Manchester, London, uh, Boston in the in the US as well is is a huge one. And it's easy to go there and think, you know, I'm going to see the city. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It takes a lot out of you. Like yeah. I always think if you're going to do that, why not do it after the race? It's still going to be there yeah. and you can then enjoy the race. I guess it depends on what your aims are as well, of course. You know, again, it comes back down to your goals. But if you're there and you want to perform well and you've prepared well, it can it can be undone in the last sort of 24 to 48 hours. Exactly. Brill. Well, I am super excited to see how this season unfolds, Tom. Thankfully, I will be in Chamonix as well, so I'll get to see it firsthand, which I can't wait for. Uh, there's a lot to go on between now and then, and hopefully the weather starts to change a little bit as well. But for, from everyone uh, here, certainly at New Levels Coaching, and hopefully, well, I'm only voicing um, for all our listeners, best of luck this weekend. Thank you very much. I hope it goes well. And as I said, best of luck to all the GB team and to everybody racing World Cross. You know, it shouldn't just be GB we're cheering, it should be everybody. And to finish off on a point you mentioned, um, I always think if you do your best, you should be always happy for anybody else who does their best, even if they're ahead of you or, you know, behind you. If you've done everything you can and you're happy with your performance and somebody beats you, fair enough. Yeah. Like that, that's just sport, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. And when uh, when Joshua Chapter guy beats me on Saturday, I'll shake his hand and say, well done. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, you can only do as well as you possibly can. And if you can if you can stand on the start line and think, right, I did everything I can and then go through the race, execute the race like, you know, you should. And it's, I guess it's just sort of going on from that point. It's weird going into a race where you're not trying to win as a yeah. professional athlete. If I finish. If I finish top 30, that is an incredible result. If I finish top 50, it's a really good result. But for me, those numbers are kind of irrelevant. The process has been qualify, get to the start line, be excited. And then you then reap the, like for me, the race now, this is the benefit. This is the, this is the reward that I get for the winter months of hard Absolutely. training. So it should be fun. So yes, I'll be nervous because I don't want to let myself down. But I've already achieved the goal. This is this is the party now. This is the fun bit. And if you are watching that party from home, I would like you to understand, I believe, uh, a lot of people in the running world do believe this, World Cross is probably the strongest and the most deep race in the running world at any age group level, yep. any gender. It doesn't matter. It is so tough, World Cross. It is a brilliant race, but it is the best of the best all on the same start line, all coming together at a point of the year where you can have a mix of 
1500 meter runners even shorter all the way up to ultra runners all coming together to race each other and that's what makes it so fascinating so best of luck tom thank you very much thanks again for coming on we that's will all keep our eyes peeled over the summer to see see how you go and um, thanks for tuning in everybody i hope you've enjoyed that episode as much as i have i've took a lot from it and hopefully you've taken a lot from it too as always enjoy your training and best of luck if you are racing we'll see you all again very very soon